it's hard to argue with the fact that we've got technology competition around the dollar, we've got geoeconomic, geopolitical challenges, and we've got to compete. Uh, this is a critical way that we can help the United States compete. Welcome to this evening's public briefing, Currency in the Crossfire. I'm Maggie Lake, and I'm your moderator for this evening. So as many of you, I'm going to take a seat as we talk about this. Um, as many of you, are, I'm sure, are aware in the headlines, U.S. dollar is facing unprecedented challenges. Concerted action by Russia and China, the rise of central bank digital currencies, doubts about U.S. macroeconomic policies— I'm thinking a few of you might have heard about the debt ceiling that's happening. Fierce new competition among global, par global trading partners. I mean, the list is, is fairly long. At the same time, digital assets, specifically digital dollars, are playing an increasing role in global finance and commerce. So the question on the minds of many is, how is the U.S. going to navigate these uncharted waters and leverage new tools to preserve the influence, efficiency, and national security attributes of dollar-denominated world order. We're going to try to shed some light on that very important question as we discuss digital dollars, stable coins, and ways to ensure the U.S. dollar continues to serve a vital role in the 21st century economy. Before diving in, I'd like to extend a big thanks to Circle for helping us make this event possible. I'm honored to welcome to the stage Jeremy Allaire, co-founder, chairman, and CEO of Circle. All right. So we're assuming that everyone in the room has a little bit of working knowledge of uh, of digital assets, digital currencies. But Jeremy, I think it would be really helpful to sort of set the stage for us and talk a little bit about the competitive landscape um, when we're talking about digital currencies. Where are we in terms of adoption and regulation globally? Yeah, I mean, it's it's been fascinating. Obviously, the phenomenon of digital currency has been with us for 10 years. Uh, and and the phenomenon of dollar-based digital currencies has been re really on the scene for, you know, five or six years. Uh, and we've had big, you know, big efforts. Uh, some of them failed uh, from big tech companies that thought about launching uh, digital currencies. Uh, that spawned a big global regulatory discussion about this. It also spawned nation state actors uh, to uh, to begin to you know look at how they might compete and 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 really it was several years ago that uh, you know the the focus on you know digital currencies whether it be a dollar digital currency a yuan digital currency a euro digital currency started to emerge and I think the idea of this as a as a new uh, frontier of technology innovation uh, came into focus and and so. Over several years, we've seen global bodies like the Financial Stability Board come up with recommendations on how to regulate global stablecoins. Uh, you've seen that begin to work its way into law around the world uh, and into practice in terms of countries that are that are doing things. Uh, you know, uh, obviously, uh, China is ahead of almost every other country in the world, uh, but with a very specific model, which is really centered around government control, mm -hmm. government surveillance. And really the government crowding out the private sector in terms of how this technology is going to work. Uh, but most of the rest of the world is, is designing law around a, you know, a, a framework that allows for open competition, open innovation, internet, you know, scale use, uh, but with, uh, you know, clear regulation around it. And so we've seen model laws passed in the European Union. Uh, we've, we're seeing laws about to emerge in the United Kingdom. Uh, we're seeing laws about to be finalized in Japan, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, other markets. And obviously, this is a very live policy issue here in the United States. It sounds like we're at a tipping point because plans were being put in place. But I'm seeing now they're trialing it in China. They're going to start paying uh, government workers in, in a town. It's not in Beijing necessarily, but it's but it's it's actually in the real economy in this. So this is moving pretty rapidly right now. Well, it is it is in the sense that yes, we're we're seeing that. On the flip side, I think it's also noteworthy that dollar based digital currencies are already operating at scale on the internet. Um, you know, USDC, for example, has handled over ten trillion dollars of transactions on the internet. 
Uh, and that's still in the very early stages. Um, and dollar referenced, uh, digital currencies are the most, uh, prominent, uh, and, and predominant use of blockchain technology today. And so the, the dollar is, is happening, uh, out there, uh, and in some ways in a larger way than, than some of these others. Mm. Uh, but it's not yet an integrated part of the financial system. It's not yet something that, you know, corporations and households mm. and financial institutions know how to interact with. And there's real safety and soundness issues, uh, and, and, and the like. And, and I think that's where the, the, the regulation, um, you know, is, is really critical. Um, but, you know, I think as, as, as we talked, as you introduced in, in the broader topic, I mean, I, I, I think this is, uh, not just about what's happening in digital currency. It's, it's sort of about what's happening with the dollar itself yeah. and the role of the dollar in a global context. And, uh, t- t- what are the measures that the United States can take? to ensure that the dollar remains the predominant currency in the age of the internet. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so it, it is, you know, now this is geopolitical, it's geoeconomic, it's a strategic issue, it's a national security issue, it's a competitiveness issue. And so, uh, coming up with a clear, you know, f- framework for this is critical for dollar competition. Um, and the United States can choose a path of allowing, uh, you know, private sector innovation to flourish and compete open internet innovation grounded in, you know, I believe Western liberal ideals, uh, or, you know, it, it can wait around for many other blocks to build alternatives uh, on the internet to the dollar. I think this touches on an important point. Why are they running so hard? Uh, I mean, we see, so we mentioned China, India, huge, huge rollouts of their already very digital advance on their digital rails they're laying, experimenting with a central bank digital coin, UAE has a huge program that they've launched. Why are they all running so fast? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, there's been this theme of de-dollarization for a long time. And people talk about it every 10 years. Uh, and people say, oh, it's not going to really happen. Uh, and I think we're, we're now at a really different place. Um, and, you know, the, the, you cannot miss uh, the news every day and hear about different initiatives to denominate different types of trade uh, in, in alternative currencies or efforts to establish new alternative payment systems. And I think this is part of the multipolar world that's emerging is there's a desire to have autonomy outside of, uh, of the dollar. Especially and it, post Ukraine. Uh, very much so. I mean, I think there's, there's concern about weaponization. Uh, there's concern about what could happen, uh, in, in, if, if you're not on the right side of the United States. Uh, and that's that's a concern that's driving some things. Uh, there's there's concern about um, you know the 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 indebtedness of the United States government, um, and and that's a concern for people who hold T bills and the like over the long over a very long term period. Uh, and so you're seeing some of these shifts. You're seeing reserve status shift uh, and the like. And I think it, it's important not to you know uh, uh, you know o- overhype this because mm-hmm. you know these are these are things that happen. Over decades, uh, but I think it's it's also really critical because it's a moment in time where things very much feel different. The 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 the, the realignment that's happening around the world is real, uh, and that's political and economic, and that's real. And so the the kind of efforts to create these alternative systems are much more genuine than ever in the past. And I, I like to kind of think about it as you you, you can sort of say, well, I, that's not going to be challenged for a long time, uh, but I think that's like the frog in the boiling water. And I think you got to decide when you're going to get out, uh, and what are you going to do about it? And so, uh, you know, from my perspective, you know, uh, digital dollars, uh, you know, having sound regulation around this industry and, and making digital dollars a, an export product to the internet and to the world is, is really critical from a competitiveness perspective right now. So what, if, if we're seeing this embrace and movement on both Testing it in, in real time in their economies, getting frameworks, regulation around. What is, what's the impact of that on the U.S.? What is, where are we versus that? And what is, what is the impact of the dollar dominance? Why is this a risk that we're talking about? Well, obviously, um, uh, it, it, the, the predominance of the dollar is incredibly beneficial to the, the, the way our government operates, the influence we have in economic behavior around the world. The depths of the trade relationships that we can have 
uh, and and the and that is is an underpinning for political uh, coordination and collaboration, and so it's foundational to uh, you know also I think the kind of rules based order that uh, the United States wants to continue to see, mm. uh, and so I think it's a it's a critical piece there. Um, you know I think the the other response though is I think um, it, it's it's generally a lot of times people think about the dollar and they think about it as um, you know we we, we have. Um, you know, it's it's a, a system run by the Federal Reserve, and the dollar is kind of a, the monetary policy of the United States. The dollar is the you know the the degree to which the U.S. government can finance its debts. The sort of the dollar is these things. Increasingly, though, I think the world needs to understand that currencies are technologies, and we're talking about the form factor of the currency. And we've seen that evolve. The form factor of the dollar went from being, you know, paper cash to, uh, you know, bank uh, uh, credits uh, to physical uh, checks to ATM machines to credit cards and debit cards to Apple Pay and PayPal and now stable coins, right? So the form factor is changing. But we're in, an, in, in kind of an exponential tech era, right? The compounding nature of technology improvement, open technology improvement, we see that right in front of us with AI at an extraordinary pace right now. And so the, the, the kind of obsolescence of technology and the way in which technology amplifies and becomes a, a huge part of how, how, you know, money works. Mm. I don't think people fully understand how much this is technology competition. I think that's a really important point because we, you're right, this has come up and people always talk about it. Um, it comes up at conferences. It comes up when I host shows on Real Vision and you have people knock it down and say you don't have any other instrument that's as stable and that's as liquid, um, and especially when you're talking about vis-a-vis the Chinese yuan, for instance. However, you're at a point now where there is this technology yeah. that's making it possible to have an alternative. And it's increasing so quickly. I mean, you, if I'm not mistaken, your background is coming up through the internet and the disruption that happened in media. And there were a lot of people, as someone who used to work in traditional media, a lot of people who said, oh, you'll never, there's such deep ties and loyalty. And then it exponentially changed before our eyes. Are we at a tipping point with the technology? Is that the difference this time? I think we are. I mean, you know, blockchains are a breakthrough innovation. They enable, you know, these sort of digital cash equivalent instruments to uh, be accessible and usable by any device connected to the internet mm-hmm. to move at the speed of the internet with very high security and privacy assurances and increasingly very, very low cost. And, you know, the, the same kind of openness and interoperability that made global information flows, you know, basically go exponential and communications go exponential and software distribution go exponential and even the way people can sell products kind of go global and exponential, right? Those are now a, a reality for, uh, again, the kind of form factor of the dollar. But to, to your other point, I think the dollar is the strongest currency in the world. It does have the, the best foundation. And so we got to build on that. And so we need to take that and build on it and take that and make it as safe as possible, make it as, as accessible as possible uh, around the world. And, you know, I think one of the things that's also missed often when people talk about stable coins or legislation in this in this area is, you know, uh, uh, if you look closely at, at the at the kind of proposals that are here, this is about building a safer dollar as well. It's about, you know, building something that people can understand is a cash equivalent instrument. That is not subject to bank run risk. That is, you know, something that can actually be, you know, held and understood as something that, uh, is, 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 has that kind of cash equivalency. Uh, and so safety and access, uh, are, are really key, but also exporting the, the, the fundamental strength of, of the U.S. economy and, and the U.S. government and the U.S. dollar itself. So safer than what? Well, you know, I think we've, we're going through another episode of bank failures right now. Um, and you know th- that's that's pronounced. Uh, we're we're having issues. Uh, you know where we're continuing to see uh, you know eff- effectively a, a business model of you know you take a dollar and then you create twelve more and you hope that everyone doesn't come back at the same time and ask for it all back. Uh, and so the 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 kind of e- existing underlying lending based model has risk. I mean that's why it's so heavily regulated. But at the same time, we're seeing acceleration in payment system innovation. And I think, you know, there's an opportunity here to enable uh, dollar-based payment system innovation and keep that 
separated from the underlying kind of, you know, l- lending risk. And, and I think philosophically, that's a, a big part of, of what we believe in is sort of being able to have that uh, a safer foundation so that if I'm holding a digital dollar, uh, I'm not worried. Is this a digital dollar that, you know, it, it, you know, c- could, could have a bank go under, uh, around it. And so again, as you think about this as something that's projected around the world, that if I'm in Indonesia or in, in, in Brazil or I'm in, uh, you know, uh, you know, Singapore or wherever I am, uh, and I have one of these in my mobile device that I know that this is as safe as possible. Um, and that's really critical. And I think regulation is critical to getting that, the safety parameters around this established. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very confident that we will. So how can the U.S. adapt its policy and financial infrastructure in order to maintain the stability and, and basically the leadership that we have through the dollar? Yeah, I think about it in, in a couple of lenses. I think the first is there's already right now a kind of free market competition, uh, in this, t- in this technology and, um, and it's growing. And I think as, as, uh, you know, federal regulators and, and global bodies have acknowledged, it has the potential to become much, much larger. And, and so it's a critical moment to, uh, acknowledge the free market competition, acknowledge the technological innovation, but, define the rules of the road. And if you define the rules of the road and how you can do this safely, then, you know, you're going to see more competition. You're going to see more market participants. You're going to see banks. You're going to see non-banks, other uh, payments companies uh, and, and technology companies that can start to really, really build on this. Uh, but you, you have to have a, you, you need to have federal laws around this before that can really happen. And so, you know, there's, um, you know, there's, there's stablecoin legislation that's, you know, in front of Congress, uh, and there's a, a lot of work, I think, that's being done on that. It's a critical moment, I think, to, to look at this. This is not about crypto. Uh, this is not about Bitcoin. This isn't about people speculating on, uh, you know, forgive my language, shit coins. Uh, this is about how do you take this technology and enable it to be the best medium of exchange that the dollar's ever had and do that safely. And so this is, in my mind, you know, critical from that perspective. I think that's an important point. D- d- does the conversation get muddied by trying to address everything at once or blur the lines between what you're talking about? Because most of the time you'll say, you'll hear there's a crypto bill. That's it. I mean, and that it's, it's, and it, it's, it's a huge umbrella to put things under. Well, I, I, I would, first of all, I'd, I'd, I'd give the administration a lot of credit, which is that, you know, the presidential working group a year and a half ago said the most important priority here is, you know, payment stablecoin legislation. And in fact, Janet Yellen said it's urgent that Congress act. Congress needs to act. We need to have this. There's a consensus on that. And that came out of the global consensus. And so there's an impetus to do this. And I think that's the right place to start. All the other issues that go with trading and markets and what are these different types of securities or commodities, and so on, that's a harder issue. It's a more complex issue. And, and frankly, um, it, it's a separate set of issues from this issue of how is this being applied and used with, with fiat currency, with payment systems. And so I think... I think the administration's right to focus on that as a starting point. There's obviously a debate about how to regulate those other parts of this industry. I think there's a view that the laws are already there and there's a view that we need new laws and, you know, that's going to be aired out and, and debated and, and, and discussed and, 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 and legislated as well. But that's not our focus. The, the highest priority here is getting this piece right. And, and I think broadly is this is a bipartisan issue as well. Um, you know, the impetus for this came out of the Biden administration. And now I think we're seeing, uh, you know, members of, of Congress uh, in, you know, uh, Republican leaders in Congress as well, really trying to advance this. And so I, I think um, this represents uh, a unique moment for, you know, as, as I like to say, a nonpartisan issue uh, uh, for, you know, for the United States. And it's, it's hard to argue with the fact that we've got technology competition around the dollar, we've got geoeconomic, geopolitical challenges, and we've got to compete. Uh, this is a critical way that we can help the United States compete. Mm. Is there, does there need to be a global standard? Are things moving in the direction wh- where there will be a global standard? Are, are countries coordinating on this? 
There is there is coordination. I mean, in fact, as noted, right, the the Financial Stability Board, which is really the G20 members, you know, came up with a set of policy recommendations uh, to to put in place, and we're now seeing, you know, central banks, finance ministries, and as as appropriate and needed or necessary legislators in different markets adopting versions of those recommendations. And so, while there are some differences amongst them. Uh, there's a, 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 a lot of, you know, general agreement around that. And actually, I think there's an effort now at the Financial Stability Board to continue to kind of harmonize uh, on the broader digital assets uh, uh, issues. And so, um, but, you know, w- w- it's interesting that, you know, the dollar is the most advanced in terms of its use in this technology space, but the U.S. is, is currently, you know, the, the furthest behind in terms of getting to law. Uh, and so uh, I, I think, that's important. And maybe the United States is best to be last. I'm not sure. But given the competitive pressures and given the political uh, pressures globally on this issue, it, it doesn't feel like something we should be waiting around on. Is there a risk that by not being at the table, we lose the ability to set the rules of the road? I think quite possibly. I mean, I, I think if we don't see, uh, you know, c- clear federal, uh, uh, you know, statutes around this and it gets you know, punted to uh, after a next presidential election, the establishment of a new Congress, et cetera, that's a huge loss. It's a huge loss because other 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 regimes are moving ahead. I think it's a it's a huge loss because without that certainty, we can't unleash the commercial sector, the the financial institution, uh, uh, you know, environment, the banking environment to be able to use this technology because they're not going to until there's real clear federal laws. But importantly as well, there are actors in this market that operate offshore uh, that thumb their nose at uh, U.S. Uh, regulators and sanctions evaders and others. And that's a problem too. And so which kind of dollar do you want? And do you want to have a clear definition uh, around that, that is something that can be enforced. Um, and so I, I think there's also a risk that, you know, absolutely the worst kind of things can happen because someone else is ex- expropriating the dollar uh, and uh, and not doing it with any of the kinds of, of uh, supervision that are necessary to do this safely. Uh, and so I, I think that's another risk for the United States right now. So what does smart regulation look like? You know, I think... Um, Smart regulation. And look, there's a, there's a lot of uh, of, of uh, proposals here, and I think you know one key thing is we need to have uh, a, a definition of what these are. Uh, we need to have uh, a set of very clear requirements around who can issue these, whether you're a bank that's going to issue these or you're a, a, a non-bank, but you're going to be regulated by state and federal banking supervisors. So this is something that has to fit in the prudential supervisory framework. There have to be very clear guidelines on the reserves that back these so that these are the safe instruments that we all want them to be. Uh, there have to be, you know, a, a set of kind of, you know, federally set standards so that, uh, you know, the, the, the issuers of these are held to very high standards of risk management, transparency, uh, and, and things like that. Um, I think those are the building blocks for this. Um, there, there are a lot of other, you know, adjacent subtle issues uh, 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 as well, but I think that's the heart of it. And I think, you know, the legislation that, you know, Chairwoman Waters and, and Ranking Member McHenry had worked on uh, was a good start. I think there's, again, iteration happening on that, and, and hopefully uh, we'll see some progress. Mm. What about consumer protection? We talked before about there tends to be a big umbrella conversation but we did just have uh, Minneapolis just recently. Fed President Neil Kashkari was quoted as saying central bank digital currencies were, are useless unless you want to control, surveil, or tax the hell out of your people. How do we, is this a sticking point? How do we balance, balance the sort of national and economic security concerns, you know, the, the desire to keep the dollar, the dominant preeminent currency with individual protections? How do we need to think about that? It's a critical issue. I mean, I, I think... Um the, the, the China model is pretty clear. The state's going to surveil everything. They're going to know everything about everything you do. And I don't think that's going to work in the United States, clearly. Uh, you know, people want what I like to call an air gap between their digital wallets and the, you know, the, the, the surveillance mechanism. And I think the existing two-tier banking system accomplishes that today in many respects. And the BSA, AML frameworks that we have accomplish that in many respects. 
Um, but in a blockchain environment and an internet environment, there's actually a risk because there's more transparency of all these transactions. And so the ability to monitor this uh, by, by everyone, whether it's a, a threat actor, a, a hostile nation state, or the, your own government, uh, is, is enhanced. And so um, it's really critical that privacy preservation be maintained. And I think, you know, whether you're a corporation that doesn't want people snooping on your business and your transactions, but you're a law-abiding corporation with auditors, or you're an individual that you know, wants the presumption of privacy in, in their transactions, it's really, really critical. I think the good news here is that cryptography uh, provides great mechanisms to simultaneously preserve privacy. Uh, but also to use cryptography as a way to prove mathematically that someone who's interacting on these networks is a good actor, has been, you know, onboarded properly, that they're, there's uh, a financial institution that's, you know, monitoring what they, what they're doing, but it's not the government itself directly in your, in your transactions, right? So I think there's actually breakthroughs that are possible and we're working on some of those in terms of digital identity technologies that allow for privacy preservation, but also to ensure that, you know, actors that are interacting on these public internet networks um, that, that, you know, can, can, can be, you know, known to have been, you know, verified. And so I think um, that's, a, that's a key issue. And I think whatever we do here has to resolve this tension between privacy and national security. Um, and it's, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, a tough needle to thread, but I, I think there's new tools that are just at our disposal to address these issues. And, and frankly, I think, you know, the Treasury Department and FinCEN and, and, and other uh, areas of the, of the Treasury Department acknowledge this and see this and see that actually there's a lot of really powerful tools here. Uh, and, and um, you know, I think are pretty good at working with industry on how to evolve all of this. Yeah, well, presumably this is a this is a problem that someone will solve with innovation yes. and, and take advantage of the business opportunity that's around that. Very much. How does, um, this is a very simple, simple question and it may, may be a, a, a slightly ignorant one, but talk to me about stablecoin versus central bank digital currency. We, the people we see moving, running fast are very much doing it so in central bank digital currency, China, um, for one, can they coexist? How how does that look here? What's the relationship between stablecoin and central bank digital currency? Yeah, there's there's a lot of discussion on on this topic, and I think um, it's interesting though that that you know it, it, in most places payment stablecoin laws are coming into, into place because the private sector is moving you know is, is moving on this, and so that I think is is there. Um, obviously, Ch China is a unique uh, a unique. Uh, situation um, for, for a lot of different reasons. Um, but this has caused and spurned a lot of discussion and debate on the topic. And I think um, one needs to kind of break it down a little bit, which is if you, if you think about the dollar, um, I, I had a conversation uh, a number of years ago at an event with the, the chief information officer, the CIO of the Federal Reserve. And I said, well, you know, I'm a technology guy. Like, what is the architecture of the dollar? Like, what is it? Like, what kind of databases are you running on? What kind of software is this written in? What is, what is this? And he talked to me about it, and it, I was like, interested. Um, but it's 40-year-old technology at the core. Um, and we need to ensure that for the dollar to remain competitive, we need to make sure and ensure that, you know, the core technology that underpins what all of us are going to depend on as the core electronic systems, right, that needs to be able to be upgraded. That needs to be able to take advantage of many of the advancements that the private sector is taking advantage of today. Cryptography, distributed ledger technology. These are powerful technologies that can enhance actually the safety and soundness of the core infrastructure and can make the way in which dollar movement between central banks works improve. So you have to kind of say at a wholesale level, are there technology improvements that can be done by central banks? I think everyone agrees, yes, that should happen. And that's, that modernization is just a natural process and, and the like. But at a retail level, at, at the level of who's distributing digital currency and what are the payment systems and rails that are going to be widely adopted around the world, there, that's where the private sector really comes in. And again, it reinforces what we've seen with the two-tier system in the past. And so 
evolutions in the wholesale architecture of central banking take decades. They take a long time. There's not, you know, the, the pace of, of, of innovation for a whole host of reasons, both because you want to be careful and also because that's not really the center of, of technology innovation. Um, at the same time, innovation on the public internet and innovation with open, open software, I mean, we all can see it in front of us. It's extraordinarily fast. And so we have to kind of be able to, you know, tap that. And so, I, my view is that, you know, and, and I travel around the world, I meet with a lot of different governments, and um, is that there is a, this acknowledgement now that there is a kind of a wholesale technology that's needed, and then there's the private sector and what's happening with things like stable coins, and they're not mutually exclusive at all. Mm -hmm. And in fact, over the very long term, uh, they're, they're, they're in fact can be quite complementary. But we shouldn't wait around, right? This is a here and now issue because you've got scale actors, you've got the activity, and you've got a real, I think, urgency around, uh, the, the, again, technology competition around the form factor uh, of money today. Yeah, and the genie's not going back in the bottle. I mean, I think of my kids. I have uh, kids who are in high school. They just don't touch cash. We would try to, they ask for money, we try to give it to them, and I have to, you know, I have to Venmo it or something. Like, right. God forbid they touch a $20 bill. They're happy to take my money. Yeah. But um, but the genie's not going back in, is it? No, it's not. And and I think, you know, um, people who have used stable coins uh, and, and have used things like USDC, uh, it's a big aha moment. It's kind of like the, the moment when you realize like you could send or receive an email to anyone anywhere in the world and it just happened or the first time you had a, you know, a video call peer to peer with someone and they were in a different part of the world. You're like, and this is free and this just happened. It's like you have these experiences of the power of the open internet, the power and reach of, of this technology and, and stable coins provide that, right? It, you're not inside someone's walled garden. You're not in some closed loop proprietary system. You're on the internet and, uh, and you can transact directly. Uh, and, and that's once people start to have that experience, they don't want to go back. That's the genie out of the bottle. And I think we've seen that with other technologies, right? Uh, there was a time when, you know, Congress was debating whether or not you'd need an FCC license to build a website. Uh, you know, where, you know, regulators in Italy were saying, you know, you cannot broadcast audio streams into our country because you need to go get a special license to do that. Uh, you know, I can have an, uh, uh, you know, basically, uh, all those kinds of things, you know, openly on the internet. And, and I think, um, there are societal trade-offs, right? We have to make sure that, you know, that there are ways to ensure that, you know, criminal abusers and others have no place to hide, right? That's important. Um, but we also need to preserve that that openness, which is you know so fundamental to the velocity of the internet economy and, and what that's brought for the world. Mm. Uh, you talked about exporting the dollar before. What, what do you mean by that? Talk to me a little bit about that. What, why, why is this critical to making sure that we can export the dollar? Or I think that's how you put it. Yeah. So uh, uh, you know, I, I think at, at the at the end of the day. Um, we're going to live in a world where individuals will be able to uh, open up a smartphone and they'll be able to download a piece of software and they're going to be able to choose which global economic system they want to participate in. And they're going to be able to choose that by virtue of what digital currencies are, are floating and available to them. And so um, in, in a world such as that, uh, you know, we want to make sure that if that person opens up their phone and downloads that software, that someone wants to send them a digital dollar. And they want to transact in that because that is what the network effects, right? This is uh, currencies are a network effect business and the dollar has the best network effects right now. We want to preserve that and accentuate that and expand that. Uh, and I think, um, you know, that's about making, you know, these digital cash like form factors work around the internet. And so it, it's an ex extraordinary amount of, I think, important economic uh, strength uh, that can come from that and to preserve the ability for people to transact in the best currency in the world. Mm. Uh, do we have any questions from anyone in the room? Yeah, and maybe this is partially more of a comment, but some of the um, uh, concerns um, that you were speaking about of like unauthorized entry into networks, you know, tr exchange, currency exchange networks and things like that. But I think maybe you didn't mention uh, like quantum networks, which really could help there because of what's called the no cloning theorem, I think, and the ability to know exactly you can't um, sort of perturb quantum information in the way you can 
a regular traditional classical information because it always leaves a kind of physical record. And that's going to be something that if we have quantum networks and quantum computing might really help out in in that regard. I mean, it's built into quantum mechanics. I think it's the no cloning theorem and it really could, could aid there in terms of knowing who, you know, could, um, um, enter your, uh, currency exchange networks, um, in an unauthorized way and corrupt them or do some, some crime or something. This is where I think technology's ability to also lend a hand, as you mentioned yeah. before, in the, in the, but it's understandable because we haven't been able to keep yeah. up with, with the nefarious forces yeah. very well in the traditional system. Yeah. So, you know, there, it's right to ask the question, will we be able to keep, because it's fine to chase the innovation, yeah. but do we have the manpower, the, well, the a, ability, the tools to be able to make sure that we're protecting it? But maybe a, technology it's a, it's provides a key, that. It's a key theme. I mean, I think, you know. Thank you for that. Blockchains are, are, are rooted in this idea that we can use cryptography to strengthen the assurance that we have about data. And we can have assurance about transactions. And we can have assurance about the output of computers. And, uh, that's, you know, blockchains are these new kinds of cryptographic computing environments. And the, you know, m- many blockchain projects are already thinking about quantum cryptography and what that means and how that can strengthen it. And, this infrastructure is ultimately about strengthening the resilience of our infrastructure. It's actually a, a major upgrade from what are today not secure uh, systems mm. that have far more porous uh, you know, avenues of exploiting data and, and transactions. And so it, it is actually about a new, more secure infrastructure layer on the Internet itself, not just for money, but for data uh, you know, for, you know, knowing what's real, what's fake, uh, which is increasingly going to be a major issue, uh, in society. Uh, and so, um, you know, that, that's a little bit of a tangent because, you know, we, we build a, a protocol for dollars on the internet. It happens to use this cryptography and, and underlying infrastructure. That's a powerful underlying infrastructure. Most people don't care, right? The, the meaning they, they don't care whether they're using a crypto blockchain, anything, right? They just want to know that it's safe. They want to know it's, it works, it's fast, it's accessible, it works anywhere I go, anywhere in the world, uh, and, and they want to know it's got the protections uh, that are afforded uh, by, you know, uh, being part of the, the, the regulated financial system as well. Mm. Um, when you talk about the export of the dollar and the dollar and currencies represent the cultural and values and normatives of, of individual countries, can you talk a little bit about how the extension of the dollar in that way, in digitized form, over an open over an open internet actually extends democratic principles and values of the U.S. externally. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, an argument can be made about what happened when the world adopted the open internet and, you know, uh, uh, and the, the ability for information to move more freely, the ability for people around the world to access all the world's knowledge instantly at no cost. But that openness was, in fact, I believe, an export of those kind of fundamental values. And I think it's one of the novelties of the DNA of the internet, as I like to call it, is that it does in fact represent that openness, transparency, free society, free competition. It it does in fact engender that. Um, It can be turned against a society as well, as we've seen in in other cases, Uh, but it does, it does preserve that. And so can we now take that and, and, and essentially enshrine those capabilities in the dollar itself? I think that's a very powerful thing. And it's not a surprise that, you know, around the world, there's enormous appetite for things like these digital dollars because people don't necessarily trust their governments, their local currencies. Uh, they have, they're, they're fleeing war, uh, or, or other things and, and they want that you know, they want the, that assurance. And so it, 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 by, by making that accessible and making that available, uh, that actually, it does extend uh, a, a value system. And so, but I think this is also why, you know, um, getting regulation right where we can have this innovation, but we can have it on the public internet and, and in the benefits of the values of the public internet in, in many ways um, is, is quite important. Um, so at, at the beginning of the conversation, you mentioned like the power of the dollar. Um, and so my question is, where does China fit into this narrative? So especially with its recent brokering of deals in the Middle East, um, does China pose a serious threat in this realm? I mean, cl- clearly, r- right now, 
you know, China has an interest in expanding its economic influence. Um, and it's doing that through trade agreements. It's doing that through uh, new currency agreements. It's looking at building alternative infrastructures uh, that people can use. Uh, and so it's moving. Um, and, and so, um, it, it does have an impact. In fact, it, it just, it makes it more urgent for the United States to ensure that dollar infrastructure is widely available around the world. Um, and so I, I think it is a, a competitive response. I think, um, you know, there's very, you know, there's, there's a lot of questions that remain about, um, you know, the desirability of, of say individuals or businesses to want to hold something like the yan, uh, because it's not, freely convertible. Uh, it doesn't have the same, uh, you know, in, in many people's eyes, rule of law uh, that that sits behind the dollar system. And so um, this is a chance where, you know, there is that competition, but there's a chance to, I believe, you know, again, the dollar is the leading currency. There's a chance to cement that position um, through technological competition, but it's competition. There's no doubt, right? And that, that doesn't, the competition doesn't go away, but you got to compete. You got to put your best foot forward. Hey there, thank you so much for speaking today. Just have a question regarding the differentiators between a CBDC and, and USDC, especially in regards to um, some recent governors uh, banning a CDC in their states. Uh, what would you say are, are some key differentiators between a CBDC and USDC, especially um, in regards to winning over policymakers and the American public? Um, and what do you say there maybe even is a need for a CBDC if USDC was able to kind of take up upon that mantle? I, I mean, there is no CBDC. And that's the, the short answer. Like, it doesn't exist. It's a concept. Uh, and so I'm focused on what can we build today? How can we compete? How can we build products and services and technologies that people want to adopt and operate those at scale around the world? Do it in a regulated way and build an open, fair, competitive playing field so that there's more and more competition in this uh, uh, and, 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 let that, and, let that, and let that flourish. Um, if eventually there's upgrades to the core infrastructure of the way, as I say, the, the back end of the way the dollar works happens, which I actually think is a good idea, a uh, very good idea. I, I, as, a, as, a, as a person who thinks about technology, I think that's really critical. Uh, but that's, I don't know, five years away, 10 years away. Um, and so we got to focus on now. And so again, um, th th it's like the whole CBDC thing is kind of like a straw man argument. It's kind of like a boogeyman. It's just this thing out there and it's, 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 it, it, it gets a lot of attention. But the ground truth is that right now the competition is in the market on the internet and it's happening today. And so that's what the government, I think, first needs to address. Who do you define as the competition? I mean, look, I, I think um, payment system innovation, we think about technology like USDC as, as a major payment system innovation. I, I talk about it as a protocol for dollars on the internet. And so, um, you know, as a payment system, eventually we can, you know, I think be a better payment system than some of the ex existing kinds of electronic money systems that we have today. We, you know, less and less of us use paper checks. They happen now and then. Uh, we, we use other things. Um, and I think there's a time when we're not going to use plastic cards. I think that's kind of going, uh, going another direction. Uh, and, you know, bank wires, not a great experience if you've tried to use them, uh, very often. Uh, and so modernization and competition and payment systems is a huge piece. And so in, in my view, you know, in many respects, a technology like USDC, it does, it competes with other mostly private sector, uh, driven payment system innovations. Um, and, um, uh, I think um, there's real competition in the in the stablecoin landscape. There are again, there are offshore unregulated players uh, that are are significant and growing. Um, and um, but you know there are new there are stablecoin uh, products that are being launched all around the world in every jurisdiction. I mean we're tracking uh, I think you know 50 to 100 different currency stablecoins that are launching. Or, or have launched or are launching, and these are meaningful with significant companies, financial institutions, uh, product uh, uh, developers behind them. And so that's happening. Um, and, and again, I think if we have, uh, you know, federal statutes around stable coins in the United States, we're going to see a lot more competition there as well. Mm. Hi, um, I had a question. You brought up that there were other countries that have regulatory frameworks, and the U.S. is kind of behind the curve on that. Could you discuss a little bit about um, 
uh, a regulatory framework that you think is doing a good job? And what are some of the elements that Congress can learn from that? Thank you. Sure. You know, no single regulatory framework is perfect. <laughs> I think everyone knows that, right? There, there's, there's always, you know, uh, r- room for improvement. Um, if you take regulation that has just been finalized in the EU that will regulate euro stablecoins, uh, which, you know, we actually have a euro stablecoin uh, as well. And, and we are in the process of, of having that uh, set up and regulated through France to be part of this now EU wide framework for euro stablecoins. Uh, and it's an 800 million uh, person block. Uh, the euro is a competitive currency. And, and so we're, we, uh, you know, we're, we're working on that. I think, um, uh, you know, the, the regulation there, it, it does a number of things. It defines, uh, a way for non-banks to participate in this as well as other financial institutions. It sets, uh, reserve requirements. Um, I, you know, I have some differences of opinion on, 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 uh, exactly how that's set up, uh, but it does set those up. Uh, it establishes a, a clear kind of res- registration supervision requirement and, I think um, now kind of banking uh, supervisors in the EU are all preparing themselves uh, to, to you know, be, begin to operate with this. Um, but um, it, it's, it's part of a broader 600-page uh, legislative framework called uh, MICA, which is, is, is far broader in terms of its coverage of the digital asset ecosystem and, and the like, but the stablecoin provisions are there. I think it's, it's good. I think the United States could do better. Uh, I think the legislation that is being discussed right now is better. Uh, and so I think the United States can have a, a, a best in class uh, approach to this. Um, and, um, you know, that's just one example. Okay. We have one more question. Time for one more. Thank you. And, um, hopefully you can understand my accent. Um, uh, just a bit of a cross, um, jurisdictional analysis. I'm, I'm an attorney. So just would like to know how helpful the banks and the financial institutions have been in helping or hindering the crafting of the regulations given Obviously, the disruption to their activity, how important they are to the creation of money, uh, that that kind of thing. Because in Australia, it's been quite different and they've been quite helpful and on the forefront. So I'd just like to understand the situation over here. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think th- there, there are different components, right? I think um, there, there are certainly banks that would really like to see this kind of regulation in place because they want to get in this business. Um, and they can't uh, because there's no framework for them to get into this business. I think uh, a, a, a regulation like that is being discussed would allow banks to issue stablecoins. It would allow banks to hold stablecoins within their uh, within their balance sheet. Uh, it would allow that to be treated as a cash equivalent instrument in the financial sector, whether you're a bank, a broker dealer, uh, you know, a, a money services or payments business. Right? It creates a, a, a playing field where people can both participate and use this technology. And so there's absolutely, I think, a desire to see, you know, clarity here. And, you know, again, banks are, are not in this market today directly. I mean, they service, you know, companies like Circle, but they're not directly in this market. And so I think this would 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 uh, allow them to do that. I think there is some, you know, uh, you know, heartburn over the idea that you can have, you know, payment system innovation uh, with companies that are not themselves lending institutions. Uh, and right now in the United States, uh, lending and payments and the risk of lending is embedded in your payments, uh, uh, the, the storage of value with these institutions. That's, that's, that's risky and there's challenges with that. And so, but that's a, a kind of place I think that banks would prefer to, uh, kind of have a monopoly on. Uh, but in most parts of the world, that's not the case. Uh, and so I think this is a chance for, um, banks to participate in this payment system innovation and compete. Uh, but also to collaborate and partner and work with, you know, firms like Circle and many others who no doubt are, are uh, either already or, or intend to compete in this industry. Okay, we, we are going to leave it there. But as I promised, the bar will reopen and we'll all be here and Jeremy will be here. So anyone who didn't get a chance to ask their question can do so then. Um, but it's been a fantastic, fascinating conversation. Jeremy, thank you so much for thank that. You, and again, a big thanks to Circle uh, for supporting today's event. We hope you'll join us for upcoming events. Uh, we have a global health forum taking place in D.C. right here virtually on June 13th. So stay tuned for that. And for updates about other events, you can go to foreignpolicy.com forward slash events. Thank you so much. Thanks, Maggie. That was great. Thank you.